In the early part of 1953, a new concept in military aircraft was about to take shape, a concept which evolved from the joint effort of Air Force planners and Lockheed designers, shaped by Air Force experience in recent conflicts. The concept of the lightweight fighter, supersonic, low in cost, easily producible, the XF-104. Work began in March. Plans had to be drawn up, a mock-up completed, tooling prepared, and plant space cleared so that production crews could start work on the first of two prototypes. A challenging schedule was set up. The first prototype was to be completed and into flight test by March of 1954, less than a year away. Work went ahead swiftly. Experimental jigs were designed and put together in the shop area. In adjacent areas, machine parts were made, parts which had to be milled and bored and cut, shaped for use in early fabrication stages. Actual fabrication was soon underway, and through the production processes of subassembly and assembly, the F-104 began to take shape. In the meantime, wind tunnel tests were conducted in the company's subsonic tunnel. A range of low-altitude, low-speed conditions were generated to simulate the force and load factors which would act on the F-104 during takeoff and landing. Measurement of these forces and loads, in turn, would furnish information to the design of landing gear, flaps, and controls. Wind tunnel work at this time also included a series of flutter tests conducted through a wide range of air-speed-altitude combinations. A direct control device was used to bend the wings to a calculated degree. Motion pictures furnished a visual record of results, while direct readings of flutter amplitudes and frequencies were made by oscilloscope. Sudden release of the wing induced flutter. Engineers used the wind tunnel to further advantage in a series of tip tank tests. High-speed photography showed that separation of the tank from the wing was immediate and clean. By mid-October, the main fuselage was well underway, and work went ahead on the empennage, wing, and stabilizer. In the meanwhile, Lockheed engineers had gone to the Ames Laboratory at Moffett Field, where the superb technique and equipment of this NACA facility were used to prove out design of the 104 and to gather data on its aerodynamic behavior in both subsonic and supersonic ranges. Tests aimed at determining the span-wise distribution of various force and bending moments. Leading and trailing edge structures were investigated, as well as the effects of tail buffeting. The final series of wind tunnel tests was carried out at the NACA facility at Langley Field, adding a full range of transonic data to the subsonic and supersonic data already collected. Free flight tests provided further and highly realistic confirmation of design ideas. Five-inch high-bar rockets were used to impel a scale replica of the F-104 straight thin wing through the air at supersonic speed. A gun sight camera mounted on the rocket photographed wing behavior during flight, making available a record for a later study. A replica of the 104 tail section was tested in the same way. Towards the close of 1953, construction was well along on the forward section of the fuselage. It was taken from its jig on December 1st and moved to the assembly area for mating with the aft fuselage section. Immediately before mating, each section was weighed to determine that actual weight did not exceed planned weight. In the meantime, the wings had been finished so that they could be joined to the fuselage as soon as it was ready. 
While the manhandling method shown here would not be used in production phases, it does serve to show the simple design and lightweight qualities inherent in the 104. With the fuselage almost ready for outfitting, attention was given to the items which would be installed in it. An exhaustive series of tests, for example, was going forward at the drop tower, where the 104 landing gear was mounted on the testing apparatus and subjected to shocks and loads far in excess of any it would experience in actual use. After drop tower tests had proved structural strength, the gear was installed in the 104 prototype. A series of run-throughs checked clearances, hydraulic activation, and other operational features. Further valuable time was gained on 104 development by handling several projects concurrently. Armament is an example of this kind of parallel growth. Specialists devised and tested in mock-up a storage box to hold 750 rounds of 20 millimeter ammunition and provide a direct free flow feed to the T-171E2 gun. With revolving barrels and a very high adjustable rate of fire, the T-171E2 has been chosen as the most satisfactory weapon for the prime mission of the XF-104, that of day or night, air-to-air -air fighter. The choice is by no means rigid, however. The 104 promises considerable versatility, and provisions have already been made for the installation of a rocket platform in the present gun bay. The platform will be extended for firing and retracted after use. Meanwhile, the first two months of 1954 saw the first 104 prototype drawing close to completion. With the mating of the aft fuselage section to the main section, major assembly was complete, and the way stood open for the running of vibration tests. These tests determined the natural frequency pattern for the entire 104 structure. When the vibration test program was complete, the 104 was ready to enter flight test. The F-104 left the plant in the early morning of February 25th. Strict security prevailed, and by daylight, the prototype arrived at Edwards Air Force Base, 347 days from the go-ahead date. Flight crews began at once the schedule of pre-flight work, submitting systems and operating parts to a thorough round of checks and rechecks. The engine selected for early flight testing was the right J65W1. Thrust of the J65 is sufficient to guarantee supersonic performance for the 104. The airplane can accommodate any of several alternate power plants. And with such an engine as the General Electric J79, for example, speed and performance would be superlative. Engine run-up was a necessary prelude to flight test, now only a few days off. A major flight safety feature of the 104 is that seat ejection is downward. Getaway is clean and immediate, with no possibility of canopy interference or of the seat striking portions of the craft during ejection. Downward ejection also enhanced the simplicity of cockpit layout and canopy and controls design. In the matter of flight station arrangement, Lockheed engineers spent many hours in consultation with Air Force pilots. The pilots made clear their recommendations for a practical, efficient cockpit, and the F-104 follows their indication. Controls are logically grouped and easily operated. In the 104, primary controls are the conventional stick and pedal type. The final pre-flight procedure consisted of a controls check. A cable system operates the rudder. Stabilizer and ailerons are controlled by hydraulically operated, irreversible systems. Secondary flight controls include leading edge flaps, landing flaps, and dive flaps, all power operated.
Just before the date of the first flight, a series of taxi runs was made. On February 28th, one day ahead of schedule, the craft became airborne. On the morning of March 5th, 1954, 355 days from contract signature, the 104 was ready for its second flight. This flyover offers a good comparison of the size and plan form of the 104 with other military types. The thin straight wing with its 10 degrees negative dihedral conferred excellent lateral stability and side slip characteristics on the craft. Control response was quick and sure. came through. It handled firmly, surely. A great deal of work lies ahead. Many weeks of even more rigid tests. But the men who make the 104 have reason to feel proud. For this lightweight supersonic design offers dividends beyond its basic fighter mission. It promises to perform a variety of missions. It is versatile without compromise. A true air superiority weapon. The Air Force 104. And it is flying today. <laughs>